Hello, and welcome to our second lecture on attention here in our online summer series in cognition. Today we're going to be talking about some classic approaches to attention. In particular, we'll be talking about um, some different models of how attention is accomplished uh, and what are the processes behind attention. So first we'll talk about attention and its functions. Then we'll talk about uh, dichotic listening as an original approach to the study of attention. And then we'll then talk about some uh, different theories of attention, including filter theories. And um, Ann Treisman's attenuation theory. And uh, just take a close look at uh, these in detail uh, to see sort of how attention was studied uh, really at the beginning of studying attention. And then from there we'll move on to talking about more modern approaches to attention, uh, getting into discussions of sustained attention, visual attention, and uh, divided attention. And then we'll finish out with some neuropsychology of attention and talk about um, models of attention in a modern perspective. But those are in later lectures. Today we're going to talk about classic approaches to studying attention. So attention defined as the process by which we direct our cognitive resources towards some environmental event in order to gather more information about that event. It's the mechanism by which we process a subset of information from the virtually limitless amount of information in the environment. So if you think about sort of going through your world, there are tons of things to pay attention to in your visual environment and oftentimes multiple things to try to pay attention to uh, in the auditory sphere as well. So as you're walking across campus, walking uh, through the metro or some other crowded area, there's a lot of things to watch, there's a lot of things to hear. So if you're in an airport and you're waiting to hear if your flight is called, you have to try to listen to that subset of information, you also have to pay attention to where you're going, um, etc. And so that process by which we select information to be processed and everything else is ignored is an important part of how we're able to actually function. If we had to process all of that information at once, it would be literally impossible because there's just so much coming at us. So this is an important part uh, by which we process uh, subsets of information. So that's what really what the function of attention is. There are limits to our cognitive abilities. We need a process to allocate those resources. So attentional processes provide us with the ability to select what we'll receive further processing and what will be ignored. So we're choosing from our environment um, what we're interested in and what we're not interested in. And there are a variety of ways in which this occurs. We can listen to one voice in a crowded room. We can select one thing from our visual world. So if we're watching a hockey match, we may be trying to follow the puck around the um, hockey rink. Uh, and so we're selecting that part of our visual environment. If we're out walking uh, the, our dog, we're probably going to focus, keep our mind on, particularly if your dog's off the leash, um, where your dog is, so that's what you're going to select out of the visual environment. So it's a really important process by which uh, we accomplish sort of our day-to-day -day tasks. So some characteristics of attention, and we're going to get into um, some specifics about this as we uh, move through discussing attention, again, in some later lectures. Um, uh, we've already talked our way through a few examples. The first thing to understand is that we can focus our attention on one thing while ignoring another, and we call this selective attention. And we'll talk about visual selective attention. Um, today we're going to talk about some early discussions of auditory selective attention. So uh, we can select things to attend to and ignore other things. And that's a really important process by which we're able to process information in our environment. And we'll talk about uh, some important ways in which this research gets uh, applied and some important ways in which uh, we oftentimes have difficulty. So the other thing is we can shift our attention. Sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's not. There are things that will automatically capture our attention, so we will automatically shift our attention to those things away from something else. Anything that's moving very rapidly in our environment is something we will automatically pay attention to, which is the reason why you get these you know, wild wavy arm things on the side of the highway at car lots or people out holding up signs and throwing them in the air to try to get you to come to your taxes at their location, that movement is automatically capturing your attention. And so you direct your attention to that because of that movement. 
We also automatically attend to our name um, and some other things like that. In particular, we oftentimes focus our attention on uh, anything that might be dangerous. So one thing we'll talk about is our attention system is in some ways designed as a survival mechanism. And so we'll focus our attention solely on the most dangerous thing in the room, which can result in some difficulties. So for example, when we get to talking about memory, we'll talk about what's called the weapon focus effect, where all of our attention is focused on that weapon to the detriment of everything else around, including what the person holding the weapon looked like. Um, we'll talk a little bit about divided attention. There's some controversy about whether or not we can genuinely divide attention or just switch between tasks. I think the best way to sum this up is things that require no overlapping resources. Um, probably we can do at the same time. Everything else we're really switching back and forth. The key to all of this is that our attention is limited. And if we exceed uh, those limits, uh, we can get into some trouble. So we're going to start by talking about dichotic listening. We'll get to the cocktail party effect. Um, it's actually under uh, a classic approach. Uh, sorry, under um, filter theory. <coughs> so uh, dichotic listening is the sort of classic way in which uh, selective attention was tested. Remember, in order to test selective attention in the laboratory, you have to have something for people to pay attention to and something for them to ignore. And you have to have a way to know they're paying attention to one thing and ignoring the other. So what they did is they presented auditory information via stereo headphones, and the participants shadowed the information from one, from one ear. That is, they listened and said out loud what was being presented in one ear while ignoring the other. And it looks something like this. So here, they're attending to, this guy's attending to his left ear. President Lincoln often read by the light of the fire, and that's what he's saying. So he's shadowing this message. And then he's ignoring this input over here uh, in his right ear. Well, what uh, the studies in this area found is that participants could report very minimal information about the unattended message. Uh, in, in fact, the best way to sum up uh, what participants could do is they could tell uh, information about the physical aspects of that ignored stimulus. They could tell the sex of the speaker. Uh, they could tell if it was speech versus noise. Um, but really very little else. They couldn't uh, detect what language. They couldn't tell the difference between forward speech and backward speech. Um, they couldn't report one word that was repeated over and over and over again. And the interpretation here is that attention is highly selective, that that unattended channel is based, processed based on physical characteristics uh, of a stimuli, stimulus and nothing else. Uh, and the idea being if you're standing in a crowded room and you're trying to process, listen to one person speak, you're tuning into that person based on the physical characteristics of their voice. And so you're ignoring the others. Um, and so that basic um, processing and attention is, uh, of whatever you're not attending to, sorry, is based only on physical characteristics. And this then led to filter theories of attention, which are the first theories we'll talk about. So these early theories of attention um, thought that we were completely filtering out uh, those channels we weren't paying attention to. So that unattended channel, whatever ear we weren't shadowing, well, was completely blocked out except for very basic physical characteristics. <coughs> so, huh, Let me fix that real quick. <coughs> Excuse me, I don't know what happened there. Um, so this is uh, one of the early um, filter theories uh, of attention. And uh, what we have here is uh, pre-attentive analysis in the sensory register is very rudimentary. We haven't talked really about the sensory register uh, in much detail. Uh, but basically, this is a very short-term um, copy of uh, the physical stimulus from the environment, so there's an, an what we call echoic memory. So that sound is kept in the sensory register. Very rudimentary pre-attentive analysis in that sensory register. Um, and then we filter out whatever it is we're not paying attention to. So we select the voice to listen to and filter out uh, 
everything else. And according to these models, this is an all or none processing. That is, um, we either process it or don't. There's no sort of half processing it. So everything that's in that um, blocked channel from the, that's blocked in the filter uh, does not get through. So nothing from that gets through. It's processed a little bit in the sensory register to determine which input we're listening to, and then uh, we simply uh, filter it out. There are um, a couple of issues that come up uh, in this area. So as I talked a minute ago, uh, the cocktail party effect is an attentional phenomenon by which we can track one conversation among many. Um, and that was one of the things that led to filter theory, is that because you could block out those other conversations based on the physical characteristics of the voice and focus only on uh, the voice you were interested in. Uh, the problem is that also, going along with cocktail party effects, we will pay attention if somebody says our name, and subjects can actually recognize their own name in that unattended channel in these dichotic listening tasks. And similarly, often are able to pick out their own name amongst a crowd of voices. So this is uh, problematic for filter theory because obviously that's not the physical characteristics of a stimulus, but the meaning of a stimulus. And so uh, that required a little bit of um, alteration of that filter theory to uh, accommodate that particular finding. And that leads us to the research of Ann Treisman. And Ann Treisman um, we'll talk quite a bit about under attention. Uh, she was quite a brilliant scientist. She actually just passed away in uh, 2018. Uh, but she was a pioneer in her field. She um, was the only woman in her psychology department at Oxford. She was certainly the only woman doing um, much cognitive psychology research um, back in the 1950s and 60s. And so really remarkable um, that she was able to accomplish so much, being that she was the first woman. So she's qu quite, the, quite a hero in, in my book. Um, but let's get to talking about uh, her th attenuation theory. So what uh, Treisman found is that subjects would follow a message from the attended ear to the unattended ear. Um, so what was happening is they would, uh, for exam example, start a sentence in the attended ear and then finish it in the unattended ear. And they would actually, participants would follow that message to the other ear. In order to do this, they must be analyzing the meaning of the unattended channel. So let's first take a look at sort of what was happening in these experiments. So um, here on the left is the attended channel. On the right is the unattended channel. And um, what you can see is the person shadowing the message says, I saw the girl jumping in the street um, because they follow the meaning of that message. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And again, this indicates that there's processing occurring early in that attentional process that is based on its meaning. And so uh, Treisman came up with her attenua attenuation theory. This is not an all or none model. The unattended channel is weakened, but not blocked. So essentially the way to think about this is that unattended channel, the volumes turned down. Um, but not completely blocked. We can still process it, uh, but we um, only do a little bit of minimal processing. Uh, the other part of this is that there is some pre-attentive analysis. We analyze the incoming stimulus to discriminate between the two messages, so it's physical but also meaning-based. Uh, and then that attenuation is the filter weakens or attenuates the strength of non-target information. Uh, the filter is not strong enough to block out pot potent or contextual contextually relevant information. Excuse me. Um, so basically what this is saying is that the filter um, turns down, uh, attenuates information, but doesn't completely block it out. So anything that's particularly potent, like our name, or particularly contextually relevant, like the f end of a sentence, that information gets through. So important information then, as you can see here on this um, diagram, is we have a limited capacity of attention and we attenuate those things which we don't have to pay attention to, um, but they still get processed uh, into a short-term memory. So this is the sort of earliest research in studying attention, provides a really clear way uh, in which to think about how uh, attention is being accomplished. We have 
uh, this dichotic listening task, which is a really clever way in which to study attention. There's some question about whether or not uh, the, the, this research is as relevant because the um, participants had to be trained in that dichotic listening task, so there was some question about the ecological validity of this, these kind of tasks. But I think it's a really important way for us to get uh, a handle on where the research starts and how it then moves forward to getting to where we are now uh, with uh, f much more um, extensive look at different kinds of attention and their application. So this is a little background information, a little historical interest in the classic approaches to attention. Um, they certainly are still used, they're still important. Uh, we still talk about them in terms of things like paying attention to one voice versus another in a crowded room. Uh, we'll leave the classic approaches here, and in our next lecture we're going to pick up on talking about sustained attention, and in particular we're going to talk about signal detection theory and signal detection analysis.